Hello and welcome to The Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 175th episode, a returning guest is Leon Nafok. You first heard Leon on episodes 101, 121, 144, and 159 of the podcast. Leon Nafok is the co-creator of the Fiasco podcast and the president of Prologue Projects, a small podcast studio in Brooklyn. Previously, he hosted and co-produced Slow Burn at Slate. Nafok started his career in print journalism, writing for the New York Observer, the Boston Globe, and Slate. He is the author of The Next Next Level, a story of rap, friendship, and almost giving up. And now on to the show. Yes, thank you so much for doing this again. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure, man. Thanks for uh, having me back on and, and listening to all that stuff. I, it means a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As I told you uh, over email, uh, your voice is now my interior monologue. I, my <laughs> thoughts are now narrated by Leon Nafok, and uh, it's all very uh, serious and stirring, and, and I feel like there's a political drama going on all the time, so it's it's been fun. But yeah, it's it's your, <laughs> your work is very immersive, so it, it really lends itself to that. Um, you know, and, and I had heard the first two episodes of the first two seasons of Fiasco, and now having I listened to those again, and it was still just as uh, engrossing because then it just everything one thing leads to the next to the next to the next. It's um, yeah, it's it's really you had heard you had heard the first two episodes of each of the first two seasons. Yeah, I've heard all of Slow Burn and I heard, yeah, the first two like I'd had before we talked the last two times. Those were all the ones that you had uh, had out at that point before I we see. had talked. And then I didn't listen to any more. And then. You started the next thing, and then I listened to the. You know what I mean? So I didn't catch the end of those. So that was fun to just kind of knock those all out in one to fail swoop. So, um, cool. but yeah, it was really a lot of fun. So you so you listen you listened to the 2000 election one, the Iran Contra one, and uh, you heard some of the new one, right? Yep, and it's eight episodes for the new season, right? Seven actually. Seven. seven. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So I guess I've heard more than half of it. Yeah. So it's. It's very good. Yeah, congratulations on Thank it. Thank you so I much. It premiered, uh, what premiered two days ago? Yeah, just the other day it went up, the first episode. Awesome. On uh, on Luminary, which is the uh, the subscription service that, that uh, we're working with on Fiasco. Very cool. Um, so, yeah. Uh, well, it's it's a very different subject for you. Um, it's, this, new, it's definitely, this, new, this new one, you mean? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. I mean, you you cover some some familiar topics, I guess, in a new way. But it's uh, I'm very used to the the high level uh, presidential intrigue scandal um, aspects of your work, and so this was an interesting kind of departure to the local level, kind of. But like, but a universal story in many ways of the time. You know, obviously, this wasn't the only place this was going on, but it was particularly the you know the battles were pitched very heavily there. So, oops, you just hear my dog bark. I did. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> I got oh. three kids, so there may be screaming at some point. I can't <laughs> promise there won't be. So he seems to be having some kind of dream. So <laughs> well, that's that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> but um, but yeah. So talk a little bit about um your thought process from departing maybe from uh, a winning formula. Uh, I could I could <laughs> watch and listen to your stories about that kind of stuff all day. I, I wish you'd do every presidential scandal, but um. How did it feel to go to kind of a different story? Uh, well, you know, uh, first off, there you know there are only so many sort of top top uh, you know top five big presidential scandals out there, right? Uh, you, you, I think you covered the big ones for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, there there are others for sure, and we'll mm-hmm. we'll we'll obviously continue the show and we'll find new ones. But um, you know, when we were finishing the second season of Slow Burn. Uh, you know, we were already sort of thinking that we wanted to expand kind of, you know, the the range of stories we wanted to be able to tell in this format. Um, you know, and as you saw with, with Slow Burn 3, which came out after Andrew Parsons, our producer, uh, the fiasco producer, and I left Slate, um, they went with uh, Tupac and Biggie as their third season. So, right. you know, I think that sort of reflects, you know, a similar kind of impulse to try to uh, you know, figure out what kinds of narratives can this, you know, can this kind of look back, uh, you know, be be revelatory for, um, you know, and so with with 
with this third season, we're we're not making as I would say as big a departure on a superficial level as as maybe Tupac and Biggie was for Slowburn. But I think you're absolutely right to point out that like unlike Iran Contra, unlike the two thousand election fiasco, uh, unlike Watergate or, or the Clinton impeachment, you're not dealing with sort of a bunch of powerful people in a room uh, making a mess and then trying to clean it up. You're really talking about a social movement or, or two social movements, depending on how you think about it. Um, you know, the emergence in, well, I should just say, you know, for, for, for your listeners who, who aren't familiar, the new season is, uh, is, a, is an attempt to tell the story of how desegregation uh, began in the city of Boston and why it never succeeded, basically. Why are we at a place in our country's history where our schools are as segregated as they ever were, if not more so? Um, you know, the, the the story of desegregation in Boston is often um, referred to as the Boston busing crisis. Um, people, might, people might be familiar with that phrase. Um, it came up. Uh, during the primary uh, with Bi- with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris uh, yeah, on the debate stage. That. Ta- yeah. yeah, Yeah, we can get to that. But basically, like, you know, people think of busing uh, and it's shorthand for this attempt to racially mix schools that were previously segregated by race. And in Boston, it just went really badly, um, or at least in parts of Boston, it went really badly. And, and there was violence and terrorism and, you know, children black and white who felt like they were robbed of their education um and i think it became kind of a, a touchstone for for a lot of people who um you know would point to boston as proof that that you know desegregating schools by way of busing is a is a you know doomed idea that it's bound to fail uh, and i think we wanted to sort of interrogate that assumption um you know at this point we don't talk about busing we don't talk about you know sort of forced desegregation, quote unquote, uh, because we've just all moved on, kind of decided, you know, in this bipartisan fashion that that we're not going to try this again. Uh, and I think we wanted to do sort of a forensic, uh, you know, investigation of like what went wrong here uh, in order to sort of answer this, this, this broader question of, you know, was school desegregation, uh, specifically in, in the form of busing, um, something that, uh, you know, really didn't have a chance uh, as the common sort of conventional wisdom holds, or was there, you know, more to the story? And so, yeah, it's it's definitely a different kind of kind of yarn for us. You know, there's not as much sort of kind of uh, you know true crime ish intrigue or uh, you know secret schemes being being exposed on on national television. Though, you know, as I as I've been saying, you know, in in some of the interviews I've been doing, like we're still talking about a scandal here just the scandal was a different kind of scandal and that's that's segregation Mm -hmm. now you have lived and worked in boston correct yeah yeah what is i yeah i've never even been there so i'd be interested in hear how you describe the city for for those of us who haven't been there yeah well so i i um i went to harvard and so I i lived in cambridge for four years and i was pretty sheltered uh you know, college student who never really explored the city to my, you know, regret now. Um, I just, I don't know. I was just in a time in my life when I didn't have room in my head to, to sort of learn about the place where I was, which is too bad. Um, but then I, I was able to come back to Boston. So I moved to New York after college. And then a couple of years later, um, I got a job uh, in Boston working at the Boston Globe, uh, specifically for a uh, Sunday section called Ideas. And so I moved back uh, to the Boston area, lived in, lived in Cambridge again and spent about three years living there. Um, you know, and, and I have to admit, like, even though I was a little older and, you know, sort of was more curious about the world than I had been as a college student, I was so consumed by my job that I, you know, once again, sort of, you know, ended up moving back to New York feeling like I hadn't really gotten to know the city. So in a way, um, even though I've lived there, you know, it's not it's not a place that I feel I intuitively understand um, or have a lot of knowledge about, or, you know, had a, I, as, as with all these podcasts we've made, I, I sort of went into it knowing very little. Um, so, you know, I guess what I would say to, to listeners who, who don't know much about Boston is it's, you know, it's, it's known now, I think as a kind of, as a, as a 
sometimes known as a racist city. You know, people ha- you know make jokes about how Boston's like a extremely racist city, and I think the busing story is a big part of how that happened, how it got that reputation. Mm. Yeah, but it's a very relevant again. Uh, you've you've connected the past to the present as you did. You, t- you were talking about impeachment before impeachment, and now I think you you've you've done it again uh, with with this because for two reasons actually because I mean school is so personal you know like I have like I mentioned I have three kids we were always going to homeschool my kids but now we're really homeschooling our kids uh-huh. you know like that just sped that process up a little bit <laughs> but um <laughs> but I can totally you know I went to school to be a teacher I I have taught in the past you know I I understand how personal the idea of where your kid goes to school and mm-hmm. who they go to school with it's it's I mean it's one of the most personal things there is uh you know and I think people feel very strongly about that and I feel that there's a pitched battle going on again over the virus now and in, in schools, obviously. Mm-hmm. So that's it, it. In a weird way, I feel it's almost connected. And then, of course, uh, you know, the racial tensions that you mentioned with all the, you know, protests we've been seeing uh, and all that. So it's that's it's doubly relevant, I feel like. Yeah, it definitely um, it definitely feels like this story. will you know, would help, I think, people sort of process the present as which is always you know what we're going for we're not trying to score points or or you know make very sort of rigid arguments about how we think the world should work we we just try to kind of tell these stories and and put our emphasis in in places such that um we kind of provoke our listeners into you know reconsidering maybe some of their priors maybe you know trying to put themselves back in, 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 in the shoes of people who lived through these historical events that we all kind of, you know, sort of ha- make assumptions about and, and, and uh, sort of think we understand based on how we've absorbed them. But, you know, as we've learned over and over again, the, the way we absorb history um, isn't always accurate and it often leaves a lot out. Um, you know, and, and with this story uh, in which you have, you know, black activists in 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 the boston area kind of mobilizing in the early 60s to try to you know to demand uh some change because they they looked around and saw that that the boston's public schools were segregated by race and they approached the the boston school committee that ran you know the, the school system and 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 said look there's there's segregation here we're not saying it's your fault we're not saying you did this on purpose but it's true and it exists and we just need you to acknowledge that and then do something about it um and there was just a really powerful resistance to even acknowledging that the schools were segregated they the the school committee members uh in, including you know one of our sort of main characters louise day hicks um a sort of proto mm-hmm. trump figure mm-hmm. um you know she, she just didn't didn't she wasn't willing to say that there was segregation and and that sort of became the you know the first you know, flare of this, of this, you know, more than a decade long, um, struggle. And I think, uh, you know, this story has been told before. Um, what we tried to make sure to do in our version was really go past, you know, the, the, the busing years, which were, you know, 1974, uh, onwards, uh, you know, 74, 75, 76 are, are really when the violence, you know, the, 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 the height of the violence was taking place. It was when America's eyes were on, on Boston. Um, and it's the part of the story that gets the most play, uh, cause it's the most sensational. It's the most sort of, uh, you know, has the most memorable, you know, plot elements, I guess, cause there were, you know, there were, there were people, getting stabbed at schools and there were children being harassed. It was just a, you know, you understand why that part is the famous part. But, um, you know, as you, as you listen to our series, particularly the first three episodes, we really try to tell the sort of prehistory of how busing came about and how primarily black activists really forced school segregation onto the agenda in Boston. Um, And so we kind of tried to recover some of those, some of those voices and some of those uh, key players um, that haven't necessarily gotten canonized in the same way that, you know, some of the, well, frankly, like some of the powerful white people who were involved in, in, in busing did. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, Louise de Hicks. I, I I wasn't familiar with with her, but uh, you're right. She's very uh, much in the mold of Trump. I noticed when she was attacked by the media, it was like, "You're not attacking me. You're pa- attacking the people." <laughs> and it's like, uh, "America is always equals me." <laughs> you know, that's that, right. That's a very familiar theme. <laughs> I've heard that one before. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely uh, a lot of similarities. I mean, in in the rhetoric and and sort of the the political, you know political appeal that she was making mm-hmm. which was just which was to say you know uh, i'm against but what she called busing busing she didn't want to call it desegregation um and i think it became just like a, a real tribal conflict where these primarily poor whites you know in places like south boston and charlestown felt like you know these liberals in the state house and in the federal courts were forcing you know, all this change on them. These 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 kids were going to have to, you know, were coming in from these strange neighborhoods and, you know, maybe even worse, they're trying to send our kids to these strange, dangerous neighborhoods. And as you say, like, it became very personal. It's people's children. Um, and that's true, you know, on both sides. It was extremely traumatic, I think, uh, for the kids who, who, who were, you know, unlucky enough to sort of be there at the beginning. It's, it's, I catch myself sort of talking about it like it's some big tragedy, but and in certain ways it was, but I think it's important to also rec- recognize, and I hope this sort of sticks with people when they finish the series, that this was a this was an attempt to to, to rectify a constitutional violation. You know, like people talk about the Boston busing crisis. The crisis wasn't the buses to begin with; it was segregation. Um, and so, you know, in one of the episodes you hear right before busing is about to start in '74, the mayor goes on TV and sort of delivers this address, and he's like. You know, this is a t- this is obviously a really hard time for the city. It's obviously not a great time to be mayor, and he's sort of feeling sorry for himself. And he's just talking about it from this like, from and he's sort of operating from this premise that what's happening is this bad thing. Whereas, you know, for the people who 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 fought for integration, this was the beginning of of of, of the realization of a dream that that. You know, you could trace back to Brown v. Board of Education, which was supposed to, back in 1954, 20 years before all this happened, desegregate our public schools. Yeah, that's always a mind-blowing thing to think about, because you always think, oh, that happened and it was it was over, except for a couple of governors standing in the schoolhouse doors. You know, it, everything else was uh, changed. But as you point out, there's not just one type of segregation. There's de facto and de jure, right? De, de, yeah, de jure. Yeah, it's like the, seg- the kind of segregation you have in the South where there are laws in the books that say, you know, black people and white people can be, or, you know, should be separate in these areas of public life versus what you had in the North, you know, where most people didn't think Brown v. Board really applied to them. They thought that this was a, you know, a civil rights, uh, the civil rights movement was all about undoing the, the, the injustice of the Jim Crow South. But, uh, you know, the civil rights movement came north, uh, as, you know, as we talk about in, in the first episode, Martin Luther King chose Boston sort of as his first, you know, as the first place where he let, led a major march, uh, besides for Washington, um, in the north where, you know, he thought that Boston was the place where the civil rights movement needed to plant its, you know, roots, uh, in order to bring the civil rights, you know, in order to bring the ideals that had been playing, you know, had been on display in the South uh, during the previous ten years, to bring it to a place where people thought, you know, they were better than than the Southerners. There was a very strong belief in sort of ra- the racial innocence of Northerners. You know, we are the good guys that uh, that are more enlightened than, than these than these, you know, Jim Crow sort of, uh, you know, Jim Crow s- Southern bigots. Um, but the, but the practical effect, you know, and you brought up this distinction between de facto and de jure segregation, de facto segregation, even though it's caused by forces that are more complicated than some specific laws, it's just as real and its effects are just as pernicious on, on, on the, on, on minorities. And so, uh, you know, a lot of this kind of struggle was about, you know, sort of acknowledging that quote unquote, de facto segregation needed to be addressed and, and remedied just as urgently as as de jure segregation had been in the South. Right. Well, one's uh, not easier to deal with, but maybe it's a little more like stark, you know, a little yeah, more. You, cha- you change the law. There's, you know, and yeah. that's just the beginning. But 
and and you know truly like the south didn't start segregating immediately either it took a really long time um but yeah it was it's it's harder to undo when it's sort of the 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 result of you know very sort of complex and long-standing forces you know at the local state federal level as well as private industry with real estate you know agents not wanting to rent or, or sell to, to black families um it's 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 i think arguably harder to undo um especially when you have white people who see themselves as 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 innocents and therefore don't feel like it's should be on them to give anything up in order to create equality like that i think that is sort of the to me the sort of most kind of important area of resonance with the present which is to say like a lot of us i think and i'm including myself in this uh want to believe that we are innocent uh of racism of 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 uh sort of discrimination and 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 we're not and and you know it's it's a it, it's 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 hard to understand how people like me who believe in equality suppose that we'll get equality unless people like me give something up mm. yeah no that's an important point you know i think it's that is one lesson that people have been coming to grips with is that you know everybody's a little racist as this as the avenue q song goes you know um every you got to recognize your own uh biases where they exist and and you can't think that you're innocent and you know and i and i think of the difference between these two types of segregation there's i mean redlining what is that i mean it's not like there's not, it's not a sign on a water fountain or whatever but it's just as real like that that is that right. is a real thing that stops people from getting ahead in the world and cutting people out of the gi bill and uh just insert everything Tanahasi Coates <laughs> says um, you know, on the right. subject, you know, so uh, all that stuff, that, that's, that's real too, you know, but it's, and, it's just and, not as overt, you know, it's yeah, not and people's the, faces. Yeah, and the other thing is that, you know, with, with respect to, you know, everybody's a little bit racist, I don't think you even need to talk about sort of what's in people's hearts or what people really mm -hmm. have deep inside. It's more about what, what they do and, and the systems they participate in without challenging them. Um, sure. And, well, you know, it's, it's the it's the water that you swim in. It's the air that you breathe. I mean, it's hard to notice what doesn't happen to you. And it's the schools um, you send your kids to, you know? Well, it's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, sure. Well, and that that was kind of the ideal of the busing or, you know, this, this program in the first place uh, is that you get somebody else around someone else. And, you know what I mean? It's like it's easy to, to have an idea about somebody if you've never met them or never gone to school with them, you know. I think that's a powerful idea. I think that is true. And that's why people, when they go off to college, when they, you know, leave their, their small hometown or whatever, that that's when they get exposed to other things that they're like, oh, okay, I never, I never even thought about it like that. Like, just because I never had to. Mm -hmm. before. And I, I, I don't know. What I was going to say before is that I just think it's interesting about, this is an Irish story in a lot of ways. It's a very ethnic story on the other way, too, because... The Irish, not too long before this, were not white. So I think right. the idea of white, it's interesting in how it how it morphs over the years, and it's it's less about actual color as it is an idea. Uh, and I think that that's pretty powerfully expressed when in, when <laughs> when it, when a group like Italians, I'll include this too. Like you know, if if now you're white, and and it's like I don't know, it's I I would think you'd be a little more reflective uh, in some ways. But then again, people don't want to lose what they have, so. Yeah, and especially people who who are poor themselves, right? I think that's like one big criticism people have of of how busing was executed in Boston was, you know, for example, like South Boston, better known as Southie, is you know almost uniformly poor neighborhood of of white, you know, mostly Irish Americans. As you say, like they had been subject to prejudice and discrimination themselves for many many years, you know, often at the hands of what, you know, they perceived to be like these like Yankee elites who 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 ran the federal courts and and the state house, um, and you know the criticism of of how busing was done in Boston was like why you know you combined these two schools South Boston and Roxbury, South Boston being the white one and Roxbury being the black one, both of them were poor. What's going to happen? What's what good will come of of combining you know these two student bodies? Like you're sending poor kids who go to a shitty school into a different shitty school with other poor kids you know mm -hmm. and and i think th that sense of having something taken away from you is part of what 
really like inflamed the the anti anti desegregation movement that became like extraordinarily powerful in Boston. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, no spoiler alerts, but but it doesn't sound like it's it's headed for a great ending with this whole idea. And obviously, uh, going back to Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris, uh, which I did think it was interesting that that was the subject or one of the subjects that they had clashed over during those debates. And it was like the main the main one. I feel like it was like the moment she really, you know, kind of but, created yeah, a moment well, for herself. I think she was also mad at him for... Uh, working or praising segregation of senators but maybe that had to do with this too uh it was related yeah i mean basically yeah. and this is the subject of our final episode of the series okay. uh is like it was it's partly about joe biden and sort of his mm. um record on 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 desegregation uh because he sort of emerged as you know the sort of young democrat who had you know who'd run on a totally progressive campaign you know pro-civil rights he came out against Bussing very strongly and, and and pretty unequivocally, and it had the effect of sort of making it okay for other Democrats to abandon it um, as a cause, um, whereas before they didn't feel like they could. And so, you know, for for ten years, various segregationists had been you know trying to get bills passed in Congress uh, that would limit busing and limit desegregation. And in I think yeah, it was seventy four, um, Biden decided he was going to be, you know, with them and, and, and really tilted the balance and sort of shaped a bipartisan consensus about busing being a, a, a sort of a, a doomed idea. And, you know, to be clear, was, uh, you know, to be, to be clear, like Biden wasn't a, a segregationist, you know, he wasn't, he, 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 he mm -hmm. didn't make it, he, he didn't make his argument in the same way that people like Louise Day Hicks might have or, or people like George Wallace, certainly, um, his argument was more like, you know, this doesn't actually work. It's not pragmatically feasible. Um, it's also, you know, he would say it's racist to say that black kids need to be in classrooms with white kids in order to do well, which, you know, is always a canard. Um, you know, the real reason integration activists wanted black kids to be in classrooms with white kids was they knew that if there were white kids in the classroom, then that school was going to get more funding, you know, mm. and it was really an economic, you know, argument based on the idea that resources come to schools where there are, you know, powerful families, you know, influential families, you know, exerting mm. pressure on, on elected officials to drive resources. Um, and so, you know, Biden's sort of Biden's stance on it was a, was that of a pro civil rights Democrat, he would say, I'm, I'm absolutely for integration, but I'm against busing. Um, and as some of the people we interviewed, you know, have said, like, what does that mean? Like, what if you're for integration, but against busing, then what, what are you for? What what else is there? Um, you know, and Biden's rebuttal would be something along the lines of, well, like the real problem is housing. So we should need to get, you know, reform in that area first. But, uh, you know, the rebuttal to that is that that's a lot harder um, with school integration, we have this tool, which is busing. And, you know, here's the other important thing that I haven't said so far. As much focus as there was and is on Boston as, as the, the, the site of this sort of failed experiment, busing worked in a lot of places. Busing... Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Was, was there any success stories? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there have been, you know, studies showing that, that, that it had the expected effect. You know, black kids had better outcomes in their lives who were, if they were bused to a, to a more, you know, uh, to a higher quality school. Um, and like the, the violence and terrorism and, and social upheaval that you saw in Boston was an outlier. Um, even like, you know, I was talking about Roxbury high school and Southie high school being paired together. Like that was by far the most sort of explosive pairing of all the pairings that were put in place that year. The other ones were a lot more peaceful and didn't have, you know, as much bloodshed and they just didn't get noticed as much because, that's not the kind of, you know, people don't write about good news. And so I think it's been lost that busing was a, you know, in many ways, a successful experiment in places where it was allowed to um, really take hold. Um, you know, there's a whole sort of separate conversation about how we ended up sort of in a place where a lot of that progress was erased. But, um, you know, that has to do with, well, I'll, I'll stop there. But basically, like, we're 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 back where we started now, and and probably worse 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 than we were 
and it is largely the, the result of white flight. Basically, white people left the cities, right? Mm. And and um, because of a certain because of a, of a Supreme Court decision that said you can't impose a busing plan on a suburban school if that suburban school is not responsible for any segregation. That meant that you know in a place like Boston, you were stuck you know shifting kids from one urban poor urban school to another if there had, if if the supreme court had, had gone the other way and had allowed sort of interdistrict busing where you could have had kids from the inner city being bused to the suburbs and vice versa you know there might have been a different outcome but that's also politically really difficult you know people in the suburbs don't want their kids being bused into the you know into the city it's like hello that's why we live in the suburbs <laughs> exactly yeah yeah <laughs> We, we we're white we flew <laughs> you know? exactly. yeah. we landed here um and i say that i live in, in one of these suburbs so i can't <laughs> i can't even front um but right. uh yeah so i just uh one of the my favorite parts of your uh new series i, I don't think this i think it's one of the episodes that hasn't dropped yet so i don't want to spoil anything but you do uh cover the night after Martin Luther King was assassinated. And uh, the night before that, another famous incident here in Indianapolis, Indiana, happened when Bobby Kennedy, uh, along with John Lewis, who was there, uh, announced it and basically stopped a riot from happening in Indianapolis that night. And a similar thing, uh, though funkier, happened in Boston, because I watched this entire concert last night, actually. Oh, cool. Um, and... Uh, yeah, there was this like there was a comedian and some other weird singers, but but James Brown, man, and the JBs, oh, so good. I mean, the concert's great, but yeah. like I, I would stay home and watch that instead of rioting too. I don't I don't blame. <laughs> <laughs> that was dope. Uh, I love James Brown and and the JBs and Bootsy Collins and all the rest. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was an amazing situation because there was hardly anybody in the theater. I didn't realize that how sparsely attended the actual concert was i know it's, it's um, crazy right it's a huge venue right he was in the guard was it the garden yeah, it was the garden i think it was okay he was at the garden yeah four, so that's fourteen thousand seats yeah right i think, I think <laughs> two thousand two thousand showed up people. yeah yeah that's and, amazing. To be, and, and to, to explain to your, to your listeners like basically what happened was you know so king was killed um mm -hmm. and there was and there was going to be a james brown concert the next night um like pre-planned um at the at the garden and people at the garden were worried that the concert would like attract a bunch of young black people and there would be rioting in downtown over king's death um because the whole country was sort of just convulsed you know in grief and, and and fear and anger uh and so there was sort of this clever compromise reached where they didn't want to they didn't cancel the show because they some people thought there would be rioting if the show was canceled uh so instead, they made a deal with a local TV network and, and had them broadcast it live so that people would stay home and watch. Uh, and so Brown, James Brown was very upset initially at this idea because he realized that he would lose a lot of ticket sales. So there was this whole sort of like backstage. <laughs> yeah, James Brown always about the bottom line. <laughs> yeah, he was like, you got to make make this up to me to the tune, I think, 50, 50, 50 grand he asked for. Um, and so that was like a big a big tense moment but then you know they, they they reached an agreement and he played and you know i think it depends on who you ask but you know i think people generally agree that having that concert go on as planned and having it televised you know at least at least didn't hurt matters you know it, it whether or not it's the reason boston unlike so many uh other you know cities didn't have the level of violence uh, that people were fearing, you know, the concert was part of that. I think a lot of credit goes also to, to, to black organizers who were, you know, spreading out all over their neighborhoods and talking to people in the street and trying to keep the peace, uh, you know, some combination of those two. But, um, but yeah, it's certainly like a, just, a, it's an amazing thing to watch. If people have a chance to check it out on, on YouTube, they should. There's also a great documentary about it called uh, the night James Brown saved Boston. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Uh, I liked how he called the mayor, what do you call him, a swinging cat? <laughs> yeah, he called him a swinging cat. Yeah. <laughs> that guy did not seem like a swinging cat. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess he was cool enough uh, for the moment. Um, but I, I did like how they got on halfway through the, through the concert. They're like, everything seems to be okay, guys. Look <laughs> good. <laughs> Keep not rioting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just listen to more music. 
uh, we'll be back. Um, but yeah, it's it's an amazing thing. But yeah, you're right. Let's not forget the actual people on the ground who actually did the work uh, to to stop that from happening too. It wasn't just James Brown by himself. Um, but but he certainly set an example, and you know he definitely. Uh, I thought it was pretty dramatic at the end of the concert, of course, where he's doing the the what what would you call that thing where he the he looks like he's in pain. And, yeah he, got, he, 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 <laughs> yeah, he had this sort of like rit- ritualistic or not ritualistic. He had this bit, you know, I don't mean, mean to make it grand, grand, be grandiose about it. It was, it was, yeah, it was a closing bit where, <laughs> yeah, he would basically like, he would sort of collapse like an exhaustion and then someone would come and help him up or something. It's so weird that I'm blanking on this now, exactly how it went down. But um, basically, like, it was this climactic moment in the show. He would like run off stage and then come back, or no, he he would be walked off stage by someone like as yeah. if he was as if he was sick, um, and then he would run back and then sing yeah. more into the mic. Anyway, so during that you know during that bit, kids got really uh, you know hyped and 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 jumped on stage and and mm. and the the security guards f- sort of like freaked out and and started throwing them back into the crowd and 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 it got really tense for for a moment and James Brown had to stop the show and sort of say like look we're all just trying to have fun like let's let's honor martin luther king's memory and be peaceful and and, and really it averted a what could have been a catastrophic turn you know if you, mm. if you can imagine like a live televised brawl between you know security guards and and, and teenagers it would have been a, you know just disastrous yeah it's like the opposite of uh the movie give me, give me shelter <laughs> right um but uh yeah that was an amazing scene uh but Anyway, I wanted to talk to you. I hadn't seen your TV show before we talked last time, and now cool. I'm halfway through episode four. Congratulations awesome. on that. That's great. I Thanks, really man. like what do, it. What do, you, what do you think of it? I, I, I dig it. You know, I, like I said, I was a fan of the podcast, and then to see it come to life, you know, I actually thought that your stories got a big boost from the visual element. Um, mm-hmm. People who... You know, you, you, you have the, the, the audio bits and you describe them. Um, uh, uh, Martha Mitchell uh, was one of example. Like, like I, I didn't get her magnetism or whatever, star quality power, whatever right. you want to call it, until I saw the TV show. Like, I, I heard the episode and I was like, okay, I guess she was a big deal. I don't know. Uh, but once you see, like, her with, like, you know, Tom Snyder smoking a cigarette on TV, I love that they just had these giant – her husband had a pipe. He was just smoke and Senate <laughs> interrogation. Like, he, you know, <laughs> Dick Cavett and everybody's just <laughs> – the smoke is just filling the studio. Uh, it's hilarious. But anyway, no, her her, uh, her personality, it just – you know, the visual uh, element, uh, it, it all comes together. And I really think it enriches uh, the stories. Very cool. Very well done. Like Thanks, man. Very cool. Um, okay. Thank you. So I wanted I appreciate, to. T- I appreciate that. Oh no, no problem. It's it's so good. Um, my my question is, do you are you going to do any more of that? Because I know that you're off doing your fiasco thing uh, now. But there is another season of of your slow burn to get through, and I would I would totally watch that. Uh, I would uh, I would say uh, it's un it's unlikely. I would say that we're going to do an adaptation of the second season at this point. Uh. Um, if only because there's already like an amazing documentary that just came out. Uh, yeah, um, what was that called? Yeah, the, uh, so th- yeah, so th- there's already a great documentary made about it uh, at the same time. Uh, it came out like right as our show was coming out, and you know, as a podcast. Uh, it was called The Clinton Affair. Um, so I think it's unlikely we, we would revisit it, but um, you know, there's uh, three seasons of Fiasco uh, waiting, uh, waiting for their turn. So um, ho- hope, hoping, hoping to be able to talk about that soon. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> very cool. All right. All right. Very nice. Um, now I, I did think it was interesting how you, you had like, uh, the, you didn't just have things, archival footage play. You had these period specific rooms. I always think it's interesting how documentary series or just documentaries use archival footage or make it come to life or, uh, like there was a Bill Hicks documentary where they made the like photographs, like they edited them in a way that looked like they were moving or something like, like it's always mm-hmm. like, how, how, how do you make this kind of stale footage visually interesting? I always think that's a unique challenge that everyone kind of overcomes in different ways when they're, you know, trying to figure out how to present it the most compelling way, you know? So I, I thought it was interesting the way you did it. I liked it. So Thanks. Yeah. You're talking about like the, the sort of like, 
living room where right right, right. Uh, like yeah. it's like you like there's like a it, you can just imagine don draper sitting there uh having a whiskey <laughs> watching the news go down although I yeah guess, that was the uh, idea is like we're yeah. putting you in the in the shoes of like a person sure. who's you know watching it unfold from home mm-hmm. so uh i like the uh the episode about uh may brussel that was uh-huh. that was really good i enjoyed that a lot and it, you're right like it's like that's why you have to always like she sounded crazy at the time, but dead on, like much much like uh, Martha Mitchell, who she also uh, mentioned. Um, you know, nobody believed her at the time. They're written off. They're they're oh, unreliable sources. But then it's like, well, maybe they were. You know, they weren't right about everything. Let's not say that. But let's say that you know, you would sound crazy too if you believed what was actually happening and, and told other people back then. And, and I think that's that's always true to a certain degree. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I think I think she definitely had some some wacky theories too. Oh but, yeah, uh, sure. for sure. Like she proved that it wasn't crazy to 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 be generically suspicious or generally suspicious Mm. yeah for sure um but yeah i'm i'm just near the end of that so i'm I'm looking forward to finishing it now um you uh, i saw you tweeted about this a couple times but uh you've heard the new season of slow burn i assume all the way about david duke yeah 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 Yeah, yeah. i actually i I haven't finished listening to it because I've i've just been like no because we're still finishing uh, fiasco and you know when wow. we're like when we're like deep in production mode i have a really hard time listening to other podcasts oh yeah um, so i've just I, i've been uh i've been w- saving it for when i'm when i'm finished in about a month uh with a season um to to really to, to finish listening to it but the, but the episodes i heard were, were awesome i i mean josh josh levine who's the host was was our editor uh on the first two seasons and mm. I, I i love him uh very deeply and and i'm really happy that that he uh that he you know did the season so good yeah very again very prescient uh, for our modern times for sure um now i did think he made an interesting choice and i want to ask you about this because you in your tv show interviewed roger stone um who's a despicable person and i'm not judging you for interviewing him i've had martin screlly on this podcast and i told him <laughs> i didn't care for him <laughs> all that much either but i think as a journalist i think you know, I, I'm not saying there's no limits, but I can't think of anyone I wouldn't interview necessarily. And, you know, I, I understand his reasons, but he didn't he didn't want to um, interview David Duke. So I, right. I'm, I'm at, do you, is there a line that you draw ever? I'm not you don't even have to comment on that specific situation if you don't want to. But like uh, just in general, do you find that there's a rule that you wouldn't interview? I, I don't know what that would be for me. I mean, I, if I could honestly approach it and be not afraid to tell them what I think of them to their face, I, don't, I think it's OK to interview anybody as a journalist. Right. I definitely think it's okay. I think I, I, I and I and I haven't heard the the episode of of Slow Burn where Josh talks about you know his. It was like reasons. a it was like a, a extra episode. I don't think it was uh, canonical or whatever. I don't think it was one of the <laughs> um, you know yeah. in, in universe episodes. I yeah. think it was uh, an extra thing. He, he talked about what his reasons were not. He uses archival footage, um, right? But. I mean, Still, look, someone, I, I, yeah, someone had to break, you know, someone had to interview him to get the archival footage, too. So, you know, right. That's a good that's a good point. Yeah. Look, I mean, I, I, I trust judges Josh's judgment and I'm sure I'll I'm sure his argument will make sense to me, even if I ultimately would maybe I would have made a different choice. But uh, to just answer, answer the question more generally, uh, I believe pretty strongly you, that you that we shouldn't look away from, you know, people we disapprove of. Um we should try to understand them and how they got to be who they are and how they came to hold the beliefs that they hold. If we consider, you know, even if we consider those beliefs abhorrent, um, you know, I suspect that, uh, Josh's, you know, you know, I suspect Josh's thinking on it, uh, was partly informed by the fact that Duke is this master manipulator of media. Um, and that he, gains sort of oxygen and strength just by virtue of being given a certain platform. Um, and I, and I get that argument too. Um, but I suppose I think it's up to us to be able to describe these people accurately. Um, you know, and I think that often means you have to talk to them. Um, you know, I think Josh's, if I understood Josh's decision correctly, um, and again, this is sort of secondhand just from looking at his Twitter, but 
um, you know, he, as you said, he uses a lot of archival footage from him, and he, um, I think he even gave him a chance to respond in writing to certain allegations. Um, and so, I don't know. I don't feel like you're you're denying your your listeners something important by not having a new conversation with them. Um, I think it's just a matter of whether you th- you think there's something to be gained by asking him certain questions. If you think you can ask him certain questions that he's you know that he hasn't been forced to answer before, maybe you see that as an opportunity that's sort of worth worth doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I you know there's no easy answers. You know I think you know I'm, if I were to guess like I'm sure it was a hard choice for Josh. It wasn't obvious to him. Yeah, and and a lot of these people are are very engaging and charming and you know charismatic. I mean. They don't get to be cult leaders for nothing, you know. <laughs> so, really, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, there there has to be a certain uh, certain magnetism about these people, uh, you know, to to get into the places of of trust where they do. But uh, yeah, I mean, I understand the the fear about maybe being taken in because there's even people that they had in the show that were taken in by him, and now are like, wow, what was I thinking? I was I shouldn't have gotten caught up in any of that, you know. But it's mm-hmm. like you know, you're just in the moment and. I don't and, and and they don't they don't say the racist thing in front of you so maybe I don't know maybe it is all hyped up and they're just talking about economics really so mm-hmm. <laughs> it's very insidious but um yeah, but yeah, yeah Lu- no. Lu- Louise Day Hicks you know you get some of that same thing with her I mean she was uh she was very effective at at sort of framing the debate over desegregation in terms of busing uh and she was very disciplined about you know staying on message with, you know, you know, saying this was about local autonomy, this was about neighborhood schools, this was about, um, f- you know, freedom, uh, not race. You know, the, she, she was she was good at keeping race out of the conversation. Mm-hmm. So why do you think that she didn't work out as a political figure, really? Is it because she was a woman? I don't know. Um, I sort of, I, I think that's, it's, it's, it's tricky to say because I think part, maybe her being a woman helped her a little bit because mm. it gave her credibility as like this person taking care of Boston's children. Um, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, the, the takeaway for me was that she came really fucking close uh, to winning mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, closer than I think anyone was really comfortable with. And, you know, as we sort of suggest in the in the end of the at the end at the end. Excuse me. You can cut that at the end of the as we, as we sort of suggest at the end of the episode. Um, you know, she, she sort of flamed out at the end because of a, of a sort of gaffe where she sort of spoke. You know, she was trying to trying to rile up the sort of law and order base by saying that she was going to raise salaries for cops by like 30 percent or something or firefighters. Um, and it was just an insane number that sort of just revealed how little she knew about government. And, you know, it was, it was just never going to happen, that kind of raise. And so Kevin White, who defeated her, was able to sort of, you know, paint her as an amateur, uh, you know, and we we sort of dwell on that because it, it suggests that like a really decisive a- aspect of this election had nothing to do with, you know, the sort of core issue that that gave it existential stakes, which is to say, like, you know, race. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, um, I, I just I really think that what you're doing is 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 great. I really like your storytelling style, and I, I think that uh, I think it is a premium thing. Like you know, and I was thinking about it. You know, I I, I do an interview podcast, and it's a, it's a lot of work to get this out <laughs> and to live the rest of my life. But I can't imagine focusing the way you do on one subject. And I, I guess just from a process perspective, is it? Is it? I mean, it's got it's got to be rewarding, of course, because you you make great work on the other end of it. But like, and then when you're going through like one of these subjects, I'm I, I'm sure you're just like elbows deep in this. You wish you could just like think about anything else. Uh, what's it like to be like in the? I mean, you're you're there now, I assume. Yeah, I'm in it right uh, now. I was about to yeah. say. I mean, I I uh, I'll be up. You know, it's Saturday night about ten o'clock. I'll be up for a couple more hours trying to make some progress on this final script. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, and then. I'll work on it some more tomorrow and, uh, you know, we're just trying to hit our deadlines and, you know, the last episode always ends up being kind of a crash, uh, but it usually turns out okay. Um, Mm. you know, it's, it's hard. It's, I, you know, it's a, it's a really grueling schedule and and it's a grueling pace. I mean, we've made, we've made three of these now since, um, 
when, when did uh, we start working on Fiasco One? Um, I guess like January of 2019. So, you know, a year and a half, we've made three, you know, documentaries, you know, in, in the range of six to seven to eight hours long. Um, it's a lot, man. Uh, it, and it's, it's part of the reason why, you know, we sort of took the took the step of, of going on a subscription platform is, you know, that's a funding model that allows, uh, you know, or at least theoretically could allow, um, you know, a team that's big enough to really carry a project like this and get it done in a really short period of time uh, without sacrificing quality, but also without sacrificing, you know, people's, you know, mental health. Like, it's just like a, it can be a real grind. Um, when Andrew Parsons and I were working on Slow Burn, it was, you know, it was, Aside from the editors, it was just the two of us um, for the first season, and um, it was just too much. Um, and so, you know, right now, I, I I think I'm I'm probably working just as hard, but uh, it's partly because I run a company now, and we have a bunch of other shows that we're you know putting out and developing. So there's just more to do. Um, but like having a team, you know, of, of producers and and editors who are who are there just to help and who know everything you know inside and out and can be sort of you know can take initiative and and solve problems uh it's just a totally different world mm. yeah well I instead mean, of just having to do yeah. it all yourself i mean you know right right well that's yeah it's such a good way to like to to get this kind of work funded because it does take a lot of people I'm sure to, and you can hear it in the final product too I mean this is not a tossed off thing uh, someone's doing in their spare time you know yeah. this is this is for real um, and you know it, it's almost it's almost reminds me of like HBO or something this is like you're promised when you step into this realm we aren't messing around so if you like to hear good stuff this is like we, we put it down you know <laughs> don't worry that's we got the, that part <laughs> that's the luminary uh, that's the luminary you know value proposition is that you know they have a slate of shows that that are i think it's every independent media's proposition at this point i think that's all, all that's all you can offer is just like look we do good stuff yeah if you want this to exist you should <laughs> you should do this <laughs> right right um, um it's so it's it's cool that you like binged all three uh, you know i loved the, it it was great seasons. yeah i, do, do I you, dove do in you, off the deep end do you feel like do you feel like it's changed at all in terms of i don't know the style or anything i'm just curious i haven't what listened to, i haven't i haven't listened to the first two seasons you know straight through since we finished them so i have like no sense of whether our you know whether, whether our style has changed so just i, I'm, oh, I was I just curious know. as someone who who has you know just gone through them recently i wondered if you caught anything Maybe, no, maybe. no, it, it I was guess. no, I, yeah, it, it's it's a pretty consistent product. I always know what I'm gonna get with a new season. You know, even if I'm not for, as familiar with the subject as I am with with others, I know it's gonna be a certain style with like dramatic, you know, music and and we got the archival footage and and here we go. Like like here here's the tale you didn't hear of the mm -hmm. thing you thought you knew, and it's it's great. I thought it's very consistent. It's yeah. Bravo! Cool. I can't, I can't you, say enough good things about it, you know. And I have, I have quite a commute to work <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> so I appreciate that. But um, I'll send yes. you, uh, I'll send you some rough cuts of our new. Uh, we're making a series right now about the Houston Astros uh, cheating scandal. What? Oh yeah. my gosh! I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hosting it, but, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm helping produce it, and it's, it's, it's really good. I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you, send them to uh -huh. you after this. That's very cool. Well, what's it like being the boss? You know, because like. <laughs> You know, you're, you're a journalist, you're a great storyteller, uh, but that's not the same skill set for running a company, I bet. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> so. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm definitely learning as I go. I sort of like backed into the starting a company part of it. But, um, you know, we've like grown quite fast in terms of just the number of shows we're putting out. And um, it's interesting. It's, you know, you, you get, you know, you get exposed to sort of parts of the world that, I never saw before as just a journalist and I'm sort of seeing how, how things get made, um, in terms of, you know, t the TV world and even the podcasting world, you know, and taking meetings mm. with, with executives and pitching them shows and stuff. Like I, I, I've, I feel like I've, my understanding of, you know, sort of the, 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 the innards of culture have, have definitely become more vivid. Mm. Um, but yeah, like, you know, counting up, 
your shekels is uh, not my strong suit. You know, it's not, <laughs> I, I have a, I have an accountant who who helps me with that, and uh, uh-huh. you know, it's uh, it's it's a tough time to think to be in a, any kind of business right now. But knock on wood, we've we've sort of weathered the storm so far. Yeah, I think the the market for for what you do is is still fairly strong. I think the people that had that are into podcasts like I am, you know, we we were already we were already into it before this, and we're gonna find a way to listen to it <laughs> no matter what, even if I have to take the long long way home from taking the trash. You know what right. I mean? I'm gonna right, right, right. Rest of that episode. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's great to to see you still uh, still going with this, and I, I look forward to seeing whatever you do. It sounds like you got a lot in the, in the pipeline. Do you ever do, think of doing books of any of like the seasons or anything, any of the subjects? Because I'm sure you got a lot of material for something like that. Yeah, I've thought about it, but not too seriously. Mm. Not too seriously. I think I'll know it when I when I think of a, of a book idea. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. I, I haven't I, found one yet. I see. Cool. Got to meet, gotta meet my next juice box. <laughs> How many of those are there, really? I mean, <laughs> not too many. Not, not too, too many. many. Not not a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, well, anything you want to recommend to people as far as you don't have to do just music, but like you know, anything you've been watching, anything that's you've been taking up any year. I know you don't have any free time. Who does? But <laughs> uh, anything that you've been watching or experiencing? Yeah, like? I'll recommend. I'll recommend um, this really strange. Uh, online tv show called the show about the show mm. uh it's by this guy cave is um he makes sort of like uh documentary quasi documentary sometimes actually documentary films um about himself mostly like different aspects of his life and uh it sounds you know it's obviously extremely self-involved and everything but it's just really good and the show about the show uh is you know it's an episode by episode week by week chronicle of him trying to make a show and every episode is about the making of last week's episode um which is a real <laughs> mind fuck after you know you're on episode like five and so he's just so committed to the idea that he kind of like ruins his whole life while pursuing it and it's just hmm. really uh it's really compelling um nice and then uh in terms of music uh i don't know man i'm getting old i'm just listening to taylor swift and drake <laughs> that's it yep yep uh, i've been listening to a lot of that m- myself with uh, my three-year-old daughter she she does all the the taylor swift moves um yeah what can you yeah do? <laughs> can't argue with it no there's no point <laughs> not really <laughs> but uh, actually wait there is there is one crazy song i'll i'll recommend hold on a second okay. let me find it there's a song called for for the trap and it's by 645 ar he's a mm. rapper and he raps in a squeaky voice here just here <laughs> Just put on put on the for the trap video while we're on the phone. Okay, I don't know if you'll it's be able good. to hear it, but I'll try. You're you're it's just you're not gonna believe it. <laughs> okay, loading loading now. Well, I mean, it's, it's definitely it's definitely well, a gimmick. gimmick. It's not his natural voice. <laughs> so weird, right? I'm pausing that. I can't. My brain is like scrambled. <laughs> so it's such an odd, it's such an odd thing. 12 mil- 12 I was not years. prepared for that, even though you just. Uh, I know I described told me it for you. Yeah, I, I did. wasn't prepared for it. It's really wild. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I like that song. Okay. <laughs> All right. Maybe it'll. Maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll give it another shot. Yeah, it's it's short. You can. Yeah. <laughs> it seems so long. Just, just um, <laughs> amazing. Okay. Well, great. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you for leaving us with that note. Uh, I, I appreciate everything you do. Looking forward to seeing more. Uh, Thanks, Rob. I really appreciate the. You know, it, it's cool when someone like pays close attention to to your work, and I I, I, I I'm grateful for uh for the for the you know for the you know it takes time to absorb all this shit so it's 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 good of you to, to support the show always man always uh well hey you have a good night don't work too hard try to get some sleep if you can sounds uh, good i will take it easy talk to you all soon right. you too take care okay. bye-bye bye
Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, RSS, and now Spotify. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. If you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to therobburgessshow at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Also, if you want to call or text the show for any reason, the number is 317-674-3547. Until next time.